introduction, I, I'd like to begin. Uh, welcome back. I'm happy to see so many of you return as we continue with session five of our webinar series. And I wanted to thank, again, the support from the Korean Consulate General, General ICANN, and also the professors, community leaders, and teachers that made up the Korean Ethnic Studies Advisory Committee. It took a lot of lobbying, advocacy, organizing to get us to this point. And so I wanted to recognize that and thank everyone for their effort. Uh, so today we're going to continue on and we're going to be looking at the Korean independence movement. Uh, but before we do this, I would like to introduce Professor Taeyong Park. And before I hand uh, every, uh, the, the remarks, the opening remarks over to Professor Park, I wanted to do a brief introduction. Uh, she is a professor of anthropology, anthropology and Asian American studies at UCLA. She is also the author of LA Rising, Korean Relations with Blacks and Latinos After Civil Unrest, and The Korean American Dream, Immigrants and Small Business in New York City. In addition, she has co-written and co-edited numerous other books. She continues to be a prolific writer and researcher. Her current research projects are about the Korean American, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Korean immigrant community in Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay, and uh, second generation Korean American transnationalism. And with that, I'd love to welcome Professor Park. Thank you, Hera. Uh, I, I'm given only five minutes, so I'll directly move on to the theme that uh, I am assigned to address today. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, the user question. I'm sure you have discussed many times. Uh, why ethnic studies? Uh, why Korean American ethnic studies? And how uh, Korean American ethnic studies is also related to today's topic, independence movement. Uh, or Korean American history. Why studying uh, Korean American history is a way uh, also to, uh, to cover uh, ethnic studies. Uh, I think we have to understand and uh, uh, understand here that uh, we, we have to help uh, children uh, navigate the, uh, this kind of uh, inequalities of uh, of the US racial climate. And I'm not talking about just racism. Uh, I think US, uh, I mean, like gender studies and sexuality studies, uh, we have to look at the uh, lives and experiences here in the US from uh, race and uh, ethnicity, racialized and ethnicized lens because US has been racialized and ethnicized, uh, then the, that means that uh, US is not on just immigrant uh, country. Uh, I mean, we, we do talk about it easily. Uh, US has been immigrant country. That isn't necessarily right, you know? Uh, then what? Uh, US has been a settler colonialist and slavery society. That means that uh, we took it over the land and resource belong to Native Americans. You know? So they are dispossessed of their land and resources. So that's why uh, we, from the beginning, you know, uh, we have to understand here that US as a settler colonialist society and also slavery. Slavery has been institutionalized Otherwise, we'll never understand why still African Americans are subjected to like police, you know, violence. I think it's a continuing that tradition. So, uh, so uh, I think we uh, do talk about. Otherwise, we do talk about these contradictions, uh, like as if U.S. is a club line or. Uh, multicultural societies, you know, without really um, addressing uh, white privilege or racial politics and uh, other identity issues, I would say that. All right. Um, 
So, uh, and also capitalist society, U.S. has been a settler colonialist and, uh, you know, slavery society and also capitalist society. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the, therefore, uh, Korean American uh, ethnic studies uh, should be more than just uh, enjoying Korean food, you know, uh, or, or um, K-pop, you know, those are uh, what we call uh, Korean cultural bite. Uh, but I think it's uh, sometimes it is uh, commodified, you know. Um, and also uh, in the US, uh, Korean American culture and Korean Americans have been uh, seen filtered through the particular lens, uh, what we call Western lens or in the US American lens. And often it tended to essentialize everything about Korean Americans and Korean American culture. Uh, I'm not talking about just the negative portrayers, but easy way to understand here is in a very stereotypical way. So we have to go beyond. Uh, so, uh, so in, in, a, in a way that uh, I think uh, in this way, uh, we, we need to talk about uh, Korean American culture uh, with, with certain uh, reflexivity, you know, certain reflexivity and also certain flexibility. Uh, so, uh, so it would be meaningful, uh, you know, to talk about even particularly for Korean Americans to talk about their future, uh, not really frozen in the past, I would say that. All right, so, uh, so I think uh, I already mentioned uh, U.S. has been a capitalist society that explains uh, at the uh, turn of the early last century, uh, number of thousands of several thousands of Koreans were brought in to Hawaii to work on sugar plantations, you know, that uh, for capitalist interest, I would say that. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, so in, in a way, um, then uh, why really Koreans left? And uh, again, uh, it is like, I mean, we have to understand here that uh, it wasn't just out of nowhere for no reason that Koreans left Korea, right? As you know, uh, Korea was, you know, uh, was about to be annexed to Japan and uh, Koreans were uploaded, you know, in the early 20th century and dislocated. And uh, that is why they were relocated uh, in China, Japan, all the Soviet Union and also uh, US. All right. Um, and, and then, uh, so therefore, uh, so, I mean, what I'm saying here is that we have to understand here that in a way that uh, always uh, colonialism, imperial, imperialism mattered in a way to explain even immigrations. I'll say that. All right. So, in Hawaii, as you know, uh, Korean immigrants continue to engage in uh, anti colonial nationalist. Uh, and uh, also independence movement or sovereignty movement. And uh, for that matters, uh, I think the Korean American experience was very typical uh, ethnic minority experience because uh, in the world those days, uh, it was rather common. You know, it's not limited to Korea. Uh, so uh, when we teach uh, heritage student or non-heritage student, uh, I think we have to let them know it was a very typical case. So therefore it is very useful to use Korean American case. It's not an exceptional case, I would say that. Uh, so I think they, uh, they were engaged and uh, to an extent that Korean immigrants, Korean Americans, they were oblivious to racism because they are so much into independence movement at that time. Right, uh, so uh, so I, I, I would say that uh, 
well, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't look at the time here. <laughs> All right. So, so I think that is why uh, when we talk about Korean American ethnic studies, it should be more than uh, appreciating, you know, Korean food or enjoying K-pop. And we have to look into their struggle, their history, Korean American history. And, and then also uh, today, uh, uh, I think we'll hear about independence movement and I mean, you know, to the, the, this new generation of Korean Americans and non-Korean American students. Uh, if you talk about independence movement, they are gonna say, so what? Well, how is it related, <laughs> you know? But, but I think uh, the uh, anti-colonial uh, struggle and movement in, and independence movement is exactly the core of ethnic studies because ethnic studies uh, uh, was really, it was a political movement and ethnic studies is, was not a just academic topic. It was a political movement and it was a way for self-determination, you know, and uh, decolonize uh, really uh, what you uh, learned about yourself. And as I mentioned, that was just through very essentialized Western lens or whatever lens in the US and we we'll have to decolonize. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I'm shy. <laughs> Pass the time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Oh, no, this was wonderful. Professor Park, thank you so much. And I definitely, hopefully you'll be able to stay around to the end. So we have time to ask you some questions and we can pick your brain some more. Uh, at this point, I would like to transition to uh, Unji Kang, who is a middle school teacher at Bohannon Middle School. Uh, she is our content expert, as well as the uh, individual who developed the Korean independence movement lesson in the um, uh, ethnic studies model curriculum. She is also a member of the advisory committee. Uh, she is an accomplished classroom teacher. And it is my pleasure to introduce Unji Kang. Hello, um, I'm so Unji or EJ Kong. I am a fifth year a history teacher at Bohanna Middle School up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and I teach in a middle school, so my kids are little, little, <laughs> really lovely. <laughs> it's kind of interesting age. Um, I really enjoyed them this year. I'm so glad that we are back to uh, in-person class. Um, I've been having so much fun. I just want to make a couple of comments um, about what Professor Park, Park said. I, your remark kind of reminds me of one of the conferences I went to. Uh, actually, he, uh, she is a professor at UCLA History Department. I forgot her name, but one, uh, one, what, he, what she was saying was America. It was, she really asked a question, and I actually brought that back to my classroom as a wall question, which was, is America a country or nation of immigrants or settlers, right? And I had a huge conversation with my eighth graders. I honestly, I was so thrown off by the question for days and days. Obviously I am going to actually have that conversation with my eighth graders in US history class. So also another thing that it kind of reminds me of was during distance learning, a lot of my students, my middle schoolers, seventh graders, eighth, eighth graders, they started putting their pronouns right next to their names he, she, and a lot of times I realized that their biological sex is different than their, uh, their personal pronouns. So which, is, as we know, all know, adolescents, especially early adolescent time, uh, time they start kind of explicating or maybe realizing their identity. Uh, so our K-12, especially in secondary education, I think identity is a very, very important keyword. So that's why I thought, um, this lesson, even though I created it, because it, ethnic studies mostly for, um, we aim ninth graders to 12th graders. I wrote this lesson for high schoolers, um, but I think this is something that you can definitely modify for if you are suggesting this for any lower grade, I, th I think definitely you can do it. And like uh, what Prof uh, Professor Park said, I think this is definitely something about, like we, we, we can relate especially if you are teaching in uh, any schools that have many diver diverse, or maybe not really diverse because my school is not diverse. 70% um, Hispanic or Latinx community, it's not a diverse school. 
So we have majority uh, people, a student of color. We have less than 5% uh, Caucasian heritage students. So it's not a diverse school, but I think we can definitely relate those students, even if they're learning about Korean, experience, Korean American experiences, they can still relate that. Uh, I think I'm, I am allowed to share. Uh, can you please allow me to share my screen so that it's probably easier to follow if I share the screen? Sorry, my voice is kind of catchy because I've been yelling at, I didn't mean to yell, but you know, with a masks on, with two fans on, I've been yelling like for the last five weeks. So my voice is not that great. Uh, can I? Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to I'm going to share this right now. Um, so uh, let me put this down so that it's easier to see. I feel like I just have to resurrect my Zoom skill because I haven't done Zoom, a Zoom for a while. Okay, so the title I think title really gives you some ideas, right? By the way, how much time do I have? I just want to be, um, I believe about 10 minutes. Okay, so let me, okay, thank you. So the Korean independence movement in the US and its significance for the Korean American community in the early 20th century. It's been hundred years, but we still, I think it's very important for us. Um, so even though I don't call myself as Korean American, I just still call myself as Korean. There's also another identity issue because I don't know how you, call, uh, many of you, uh, who are Korean, uh, who are Korean descent or Koreans. Um, but I think it's really important how, um, oops, somebody's a host. Uh, I, I think you made me a host, right? Uh, so I see somebody's in the waiting room. Anyways, um, so I think this is definitely, there, there should be some time, uh, some type of uh, kind of prerequisite before this colonialism, imperialism in the, especially early 20th century and the, in the deep, a deeper interconnectivity um, between nations or even states or even regions. I think that's definitely should be, it must be the prerequisite before this lesson. Also, of course, the, uh, the America, the rise of America as a, one of the superpowers because they were about to rise or they were already one of the superpowers, but not, they were like, they were not the superpower, the superpower yet or anti-immigration acts in the US or anti-immigrant sentiment, that should be the prerequisite. And this, this lesson, um, and I'm pretty sure we all know a little bit of or more about a lot about history uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, what happened in Korea. So the challenges of uh, Korean immigrants, uh, Korean immigrants, so there's a typo, sorry. Um, Korean image to challenges is they were experiencing um, anti-immigrant sentiment here in the new country. It is already hard uh, being in a new country, but also it was mostly they were kind of pushed out. They were pushed out of their homeland because of Japan's aggression. And there were already a lot of them started moving out because they were getting colonized or they, they saw what was coming. So the leaders, um, the leaders of Korean American community were, many of them were Korean independent activists. So of course uh, they were the educated people and they were uh, the leaders in many different ways. And I'm not gonna go over everything, mm -hmm. but uh, if you're looking for any standard content standard or the new framework, uh, history, social science, the framework. Um, I found some questions there too. I'm going to skip over. So there were some. I um, here we go. Are questions like may kind of those are three levels of question like uh, questions. The first one, push and pull factors. I think this is very very common theme for any types of movement. So if any high school teachers went over. Um, all the push and pull factors of different immigrant groups, which uh, Irish groups are always one of the very first things they deal with around like that time, same time period, or they actually focused on Irish immigrants a lot. And how did Korean immigrants respond to challenges, uh, the face, uh, what they faced, and how did the Korean, the final question, how did the Korean independence activists in, U, in the US actually affect the establishment of early Korean American identity. 
So one thing that kind of made me think about the whole thing was, well, we don't really say, when we say Korean, uh, Korean American or Korean immigrants, we don't really say South Korean immigrants or North Korean immigrants. So I think that's something that kind of interesting because when we say, but I don't think I ever said I'm from South Korea uh, when I first moved to the States. I started saying it after I heard like, oh, are you from South or North? So, so I was kind of annoyed and that's why I started saying I'm from South Korea, but I think majority of us um, who were born and raised in Korea, South, South Korea, I don't think we actually say that uh, South, we are from South Korea. So that, I think that can be something interesting because I this was like Korean immigrants. So this is, a, it, it, I think it's really important to also revisit like, okay, there were before um, Cold War or Korean War and stuff. So these are all handouts, but I'm gonna go over this in the actual document. So let me see this one. By the way, I think we are going to post this uh, slide. So, uh, at the end of the slide, I, um, I put the link so you can all go to here. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna show all of them together first and then uh, point out a couple of important things. This is a really, really long document. <laughs> um, so, cause I, I really try to make it as easy as possible for teachers who don't really have any background knowledge or who don't know how to navigate this. So step-by-step, step, all the lessons are pretty, I think is more than enough. And also if they are on Google Docs, um, they can also just go directly go to here. Oops, I gotta fix that. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Sometimes it happens. So day five, so it's four to five day lesson for, I think for 10th graders or 11th graders but maybe ninth graders, especially this year or next year, because of um, kind of pause of learning, I think I, I fear that it, they need a little more support. So uh, I told you about, uh, uh, explained about push and pull, pack, pull factors. Um, they can work on that. And, and let's see, well, let me actually go to the source first because that helps more. Okay, so I used, I tried to use primary source a lot uh, and also try to use different types of sources, uh, reading uh, just text only and also visuals too. So it shows you how like domestic, some, some type, uh, some uh, events around the time when a lot of Korean, uh, Koreans started moving to the US uh, and then uh, some significant events timeline. And so Asians, uh, Americans, general overview of um, the, the background, the historical background of Korean dias diaspora in the beginning of um, 20th century. And then, uh, here, I'm gonna go over this one. So, sorry. So now I thought this was really interesting in Central California um, that the fact that uh, Korea, Korean, Korean Americans in the nine, uh, between 1910 and 1930s, uh, 1945, they were the people who lost their country. So which means um, technically they were considered Japanese. So there was a little, a little bit of misunderstanding and of course a stereotype and also ignorance so of course, even these days, all Asians are just Asians, right? So um, the anti uh, because of the World War II sentiment or even before that, uh, there were um, the movement for kind of sentiment that they were against Japanese, but Koreans were actually saying, well, you know what? We moved here before Korea got colonized. So they claim that they are not Japanese. So they kind of got, they tried to get away, Koreans, Korean Americans tried to get away with it. And they really, I think that was more, uh, there was their agency. It really gives agency to Korean Americans who are really trying to navigate the difficulties. So I think it was really interesting. And if you do, I mean, if anyone kind of want to get to the point, I think source five and below will be more helpful. 
because uh, the before that, uh, all the other events above source five, it's I really try to give um, great background knowledge because I know many teachers, history teachers or ethnic study teachers, they don't really know Korean history or Koreans at all. So anyone is comfortable, I think is definitely source five and below will be more useful. And also Hamid's, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing this correctly. I think I have two minutes left. Um, so there's actual um, document, uh, newspaper. It says what was happening in Riverside and anti-Japanese sentiment. And uh, here the bottom one is what the Koreans, how Koreans reacted. And then, well, I think it was really uh, brilliant uh, the, uh, strategy they used. So the, the, as you can see right here, that um, they were not, the people who are kicked out from a uh, farm, they are not Japanese, right? So that we are not Japanese, we are actually Koreans, different people. And uh, here also another one is in um, East Coast, Philadelphia. So there's a uh, Korean, really uh, Koreans try to uh, kind of, Ad advertise right and they have their own movement not just in california but the other side of the country they had movement and i thought this was interesting um here sorry so i'm gonna wrap it up really quick here so the last source um so this really says uh this also this is still happening uh, many immigrants these days are still they are sending money back to their homeland. And this was specifically they were supporting Korean Americans, not just independence activists. A lot of them actually pull money together and they try to support their homeland. So it really shows that it, uh, the homeland and where we live right now, it's deeply connected. So uh, another one that I was thinking was America was, I mean, it, it was already international before it realized, it, it, before it realized. So this part really can resonate a lot of different groups of immigrants um, and it's still, because it is still happening. So um, I think my time is, time ran out, right? I can answer questions. Um, let me stop share first. Did I go too fast? No, not at all. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I have a, I have a question. How is it that you uh, know so much about, um, like, how did you approach your research in developing this lesson? Um, long story short, I studied Asian history back in college. Uh, I was specifically interested in um, East Asian triangle and mm. from like, well, well my, special, my, my focus was in actually Tang and Song dynasty time period, middle ages. Mm -hmm. But of course, growing up in Korea, uh, you know, it, I had to unlearn, basically I had to unlearn a lot of nationalistic view when I was um, researching this. I think we all have been there, uh, especially if you, if, if you grew up in Korea, and if you went through, especially in college, because I went to college in Korea too, like I moved here. This is my 10th year being in the States. So I really just had to unlearn a lot of nationalistic perspectives approaching this. So my uh, attitude towards this specific lesson was like, I, okay, what is the most beneficial for American students? So I really had to do that. Because sometimes it's really hard. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. You're, uh, you're going to be around, right? So yeah. I, I'm going to try and do my portion for about maybe about 10 minutes and then maybe open it up for questions. We can just talk to each other. But before we do that, if all of you can please turn on your cameras so that we can take our group photo. Thank you. Those of you who can. <laughs> And okay, I think we're ready. Take it okay. away, Jenny. <laughs> Here we go.
One, two, two, two. Okay. You. We good? All right. Awesome. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and begin um, my portion. I did a couple. We're gonna. I'm gonna be presenting two things. Uh, one will be uh, a real supplement to um, uh, Unji Kong's or EJ Kong's. Uh, presentation and also I did one on related to the Korean independence movement but there is a supplemental unit in the model curriculum uh, around uh, the 14 points Woodrow Wilson and the independence movement so those will be the two things I'll be presenting and while I get this going I guess I'll, so I'll say a little bit about myself while I'm getting this moving here. I am, it's interesting we're talking about uh, when when uh, EJ was talking about unlearning, you know, the Korean nationalism. I've actually been um, on the other end of it because I was born in the United States. I am bilingual. Uh, my parents were very, very insistent on me speaking English. I mean, me speaking Korean. <laughs> And so when I would go to Korea, it, it would, you know, I was a little bit of a, an oddity. And I, you know, I went to, I would visit Korea in like the 70s and in the 80s. And that was at a time period when uh, Korea was very nationalistic, right? They had come out of the Korean War and that fervor uh, was, was significant. And it took me a long time to come to terms with how I was treated over there. It was quite um, traumatic as a young young person, fourth grader, having uh, older ajashis come over and yell at me because I'm not speaking Korean and uh, very scary, very intimidating. And uh, it took me a long time to, uh, you know, I, 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 I love Korea I, only because of my connection to my parents. And my parents, I've been very blessed with parents who have instilled in me um, a lot of that culture and history, um, history about my own family. And so I felt very connected in that sense. And I think that is what kept me um, tied to Korea despite this very traumatic, multiple traumatic experiences that I had when I was growing up. And I've always been very afraid to go to Korea because I'm a, I was afraid of being a target. And because I was. And so it took, it took me a long time to do this. I'm no long, I no longer have those fears or traumas, but it is something that has influenced, you know, how I approach my identity um, as an American um, of Korean background. So anyways, with that, let me go ahead and share my first one and I'm going to minimize this. So what I did with um, Ms. Kong's uh, lesson is coming out of distance learning. I basically took what she had and turned it into one that perhaps students could use directly. And uh, so a couple of little clues here. Uh, this, it, it works best if it's in presentation mode. Um, all the resources and handouts are hyperlinked and you would hit this little home button to return back to the initial chart. And so this is her lesson. Um, hopefully I didn't make any mistakes. I did my best to try and keep everything uh, organized. And as you can see, um, I'm not gonna go through this because she just went through it, but you have day one, day two, day three. Um, here are her essential questions. Some of it, I kind of uh, made it shorter because it wouldn't fit into the boxes. These are the sources that she had. Uh, these are her handouts um, as, and, and her objective that she had, uh, that, that she wanted the students to do. So it's, uh, you could follow it this way. This is something that you can edit and use uh, with students. And let me show you kind of how it looks. So, so this takes you to source one. Students would look at this and then you would be able to come right back and be able to view the other sources here are the handouts that she has. I hope I didn't miss anything. And so that is that lesson. And the other lesson, the other supplemental lesson that I worked on 
was lesson 24. And this is also on the Korean independence movement. Oh, that's hard. There we go. And I found this, I thought this was really interesting because I teach US history. Uh, and, you know, the 14 points is definitely something that I teach. And I, I mean, this is, there are so many, you know, connections to, you know, democracy in the United States and the way it's inspired uh, people around the world, despite, despite uh, the, the, the many flaws and what I call the double-edged sword, right? You have one side of the sword is all about democracy and independence and liberty and um, equality. And then you have the other side of the sword that is definitely about conquering colonization, um, you know, the kind of the systematic ways in which inequalities are uh, embedded into our system uh, throughout history. So uh, this is why I think I love American history so much because it's, it, there's so many different layers and so many ways we can look at it. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the 14 points are, the 14 points are a part of Woodrow Wilson's address to Congress. And this is towards the end of World War I. And uh, the 14 points is significant because uh, Wilson outlines a plan for lasting peace. And this was one of the things that people thought uh, World War I would bring because it was such a horrible experience. People thought this was the great war, that um, we have a responsibility to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So Woodrow Wilson outlines in his speech before Congress, this, this, this outline he takes with him to France um, to uh, negotiate this new treaty. And it circled around three basic ideas or principles of democracy, self-determination, the right of a people to choose their own government, justice, and equality. And to tie all of this together, there would be this League of Nations that would help bring all of these pieces together and countries would come together. And rather than use war, they would use diplomacy. And this also later becomes the inspiration for the uh, United Nations. And so these are the two essential questions. What do the 14 points say about self-determination and imperialism? And what was the impact of the 14 points on the Korean independence movement? And so in order to look at the 14 points, you have to obviously look at his speech. And so I have an activity. Uh, this could be you know, addressed in multiple ways. You can um, divide students up into groups. Each group would get um, you know, a, a little piece of his speech. And there are some guiding questions here. And the final question, the kind of the thought, I guess uh, I wanted to remind people. So I have two kind of little symbols. One is a magnifying class to look more deeply into background content resources. And then the light bulb is asking students to maybe take the next step in their thinking. Uh, and the question is, if your con country had been colonized by a more powerful country, what would be your reaction to Wilson's 14 points? Uh, what, what might you do to take advantage of this speech by the US president, by a US president? And obviously this is something that really did happen. Um, and so the next question is, how important was the Korean independence movement to Koreans in the United States? And this is, this is actually from Ms. Kong's lesson. Uh, this is a great chart that she has, um, infographic that she has showing the financial contribution of um, Koreans here in the United States versus outside of the United States. And you can see um, it's, it's significant. This is what I find so interesting about uh, Korean Americans and Koreans, here, early Koreans, is this kind of ongoing theme of, you know, this, this deep, 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 deep tie connection to, uh, to Korea and to the political and economic well-being of Korea. And I think this is a theme that is shared by many immigrant groups, uh, but, you know, I guess being, being of Korean descent, this is something that stands out to me. 
Um, and there is a short video that I found. Um, it's a little newscast on the March 1st movement because uh, the Wilson speech actually triggered uh, something in Korea. And uh, in fact, we sent uh, a diplomat to to the Treaty of Versailles. And, you know, people in Korea felt that this was a sign that perhaps the United States would support uh, their cause for independence. And we have the March 1st movement. Um, I won't share the, the video because uh, I'm almost out of my time. <laughs> and the final activity is for students to write a letter to Woodrow Wilson asking the United States support in the Korean independence movement. And uh, so some arguments or points uh, students should co connect to in the, in the letter, because sometimes students will use just their imagination and forget all of the things that we did. Uh, so they need to include things like the 14 point speech, the devastation of World War I, uh, global advocacy and organization of Korean independence by Koreans living in the United States, Japanese violation of the principles of 14 points. And uh, some extensions uh, is also to tie this in with Syngman Rhee and his role in the independence movement. Oh, so I did not add a, I made a little mistake. I'll, I'll change that. And the role of Yugan Su, who was a young woman who became kind of the symbol of this March 1st movement. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and I think, no, I'm gonna go ahead and stop it here. If we have time, then we can, is that it? Yes, that was it. And I will stop sharing. And let me go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead. I have a couple of things that I wanted to just share really fast. Um, I am sharing the latest book by Professor Park. This is the name of that. And I'm also sharing, before I, before I forget and everybody starts leaving, uh, a wonderful resource that one of our uh, presenters and facilitators has, has is doing. This is his YouTube station. If everybody could subscribe, that would be fabulous, which I'm not having technical difficulties. There we go. Uh, so he has this uh, YouTube station called Ed Family and has a lot of very relevant uh, tips and tools for teachers, uh, for students, for parents. Um, his latest one is on public speaking. He has another one on having students doing ethnographies to connect to, to, to their, their family's identity and just a lot of really good stuff. And they're really short. I think about like 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes long. Um, and I, I just love watching it when they pop up on my Facebook. It, it always puts a really big smile on my face to see um, uh, Jeff Park's uh, presentation. So with that, uh, do we have any questions? Wanted to leave some time open for all of you. You know, uh, Miss Tara, it was such a deep okay. thought that you shared uh, regarding uh, as we're striving, as it says in our constitution to be a more perfect union, to see the many connections to democracy in the United States and how it's inspired so many in the world, including Korea and this connection between Korea and America and America and Korea. What, what a beautiful and aspirational statement there. Uh, what, what, what inspired you to kind of come to that conclusion? Uh, I'm sorry, so what, what is your question again? Sorry. I was just thinking, I just called you Jeff Park, and so I was, I was a little distracted. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. There's a lot of names floating around. I know. In my brain. It's been a full day. I mean, we've got 200 kids coming through our classes. I'm amazed. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yes. Uh, the connections to democracy at the United States, all, all around the world, the, the mm -hmm. democracy that we have is, although right. we're striving to be a more perfect union, it is an inspiration. It was an inspiration to Korea. Yeah. And uh, I think that really resonates with a lot of Americans. Yeah. If you were to share about, Korean American, the Korean American story, I think the story of democracy would resonate with many people in this country and how it has ripple affected all across the world. So I was wondering what kind of inspired you uh, to that point? I, I think for me, it was, uh, you know, one of the things I, 
did was I, I lived in France for a year. And so that gave me a whole new perspective on my identity and how people see me. Uh, people saw me as an American. I was not Korean. I did not seem Korean. I was an American. <laughs> and so that, that I think is where I began to really think about this college university was, I mean, I think this is why ethnic studies is so important because it, um, it, you know, reveals these different layers that I wasn't exposed to until I was in high school. I'm sorry, I was in college, this idea that, oh, you know, Korean Americans, I have a history here. I, I didn't just appear when I popped out of my par my mom's belly. And there is a history here that is not, that my parents don't have. It's, it's a history that I share with other Korean Americans, with other Asian Americans, um, other uh, minority groups and other groups that have felt met, uh, other individuals that have felt met, uh, marginalized or kind of, uh, you know, kind of told what their identity is when that might not necessarily be. And so, um, you know, for me, I think what, what I want to convey to my students is that um, we need to understand the dark but we also need to understand the light as well and put those two together. And, you know, yes, history is told by the victors, but I think what we're trying to do here and what um, this country has allowed many of us to do is also tell the story um, of survivors. You know, it's, it, it, those of us who have survived, um, those of us who have come to a position where we can tell these stories, and be a part of these stories, um, we're building a new history, right? We're adding more layers to um, the story of this country, making it deeper and more than just exactly as Professor Park said, more than just about K-pop and, you know, eating kimbap and Korean barbecue, because, you know, it, this, is a, this is a very serious topic that, you know, really, really can mess with people if, if they don't, if they're not, they don't have a clear understanding of things and gr grapple with these questions. Any other questions? Yes, I just wanted to comment. Uh, thank you very much, Hera. I really love the fact that you made that connection and you shared your story about your experience going to Korea. I want to say that I had the exact same experience going a few times, um, but I'm older than you. And on a side note, it was, I grew up in Los Angeles, it was, I, I was not proud of being Korean, yeah, I can tell you that. I, although I did attend the very first Korean American church here in Los Angeles, it's really interesting what happened. But on this note, I wanted to say, and everybody's mentioning you know, the K-pop and the food. I took my girls there about three, four years ago. We had, and they had the best experience. And I want to say it is probably, you know, they grew up because everything is very positive now. And I just, it, it, it just was this warm feeling that I'm so glad that they grew up to be proud. All their friends, they're envious that they get the Korean food, you know, the whole thing, it, you know, one of the things we did. But bottom line is, it's just so important. And right now is the time I think we also need to jump on what's happening. There's just a, a lot more pride, I would say. And I think it's very important that we do, and that's the, one of the lessons is when we talk about K-pop, it's making the connection. And Harry, you just did such a good job making that connection of why it's important. So I wanted to share and say thank you on that. So, thank you. Um, I can I also ask a question? I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Hello. <laughs> Hi, my name is Helen. Um, I'm an ELA, I'm an English teacher in LA and um, First of all, I really want to thank you guys for like putting this together. This has been very inspirational and like so encouraging for me. I've never known um, anything about Korean American history, let alone anything uh, about Korean history itself. And so it's been very, very encouraging. I've been telling my husband like every Wednesday night, like about what I've been listening. And so I just really want to thank you guys for that. Uh, but I did have uh, one more question. Because you guys are talking about history a lot, which I'm very interested in. And I recently and very recently learned that uh, Koreans were not able to vote for 16 years or so because of President Park. No idea that these things were happening in Korea. I had no idea that um, Koreans were emigrating to America um, after Japanese 
organization. And I'm just wondering if there are any sources. And I'm like a typical generation here where, you know, I'm learning Korean history from like Netflix. You know, I, like I'll be watching like, like a movie or episode and then as they talk about like the Korean kings, that's how I learn. And I know it's not exactly like the most factual information. So I'm just trying to see if there's a way, like a book or an author or even like documentaries that you guys would recommend where I can learn like modern Korean history. I don't want to put anybody, yes, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but uh, Dr. Park, do you have any suggestions for us? Yeah, I think just uh, uh, there are plenty of, I mean, I'm just surprised to hear, to hear that these days it is hard to find. I mean, because there are so many, we need a kind of traffic control, you know? So uh, yeah, I think there are uh, there are many sources. Fortunately, I would say that I shouldn't be that cynical. I think there are really good sources, I would say that. Uh, so even about the, you know, I mean, uh, I, I would say that when we talk about Korean American history, uh, it's not enough to relate it to Japanese colonial rule, you know, independence movement, because without relating it to US-Korea relations, I don't think it's possible to talk about Korean-American history, you know, that's why there is a question, you see, because uh, I, I think it's just uh, too much for the current contemporary generations to relate it to independence movement, you know, so I, I, I think uh, we should uh, really uh, be aware that, uh, uh, for instance, like, I mean, there is a discussion that uh, I think I actually had a, as a presentation there. Uh, we have to think about it. What, what uh, role and what was the US take on Korean independence? You know, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that rosy, I would say that no. there was more mixed <laughs> record, okay? So, so I mean, you know, uh, we don't like to hear about it, but uh, in reality, uh, there is a mixed record, I would say that, uh, uh, about, uh, about uh, Korean independence. As long as U.S. could rule, colonize the Philippines, U.S. was asking Japan, uh, it is okay to colonize uh, Korea, you know? So in any way, uh, I think I'm <laughs> getting on to different stories here. But, but I think I, I want to mention here that uh, there is no way to talk about Korean American history without relating to US-Korea relations, I would say that. And also we'll have to, not emotionally, but we'll have to critically you know, emotion don't get everything done, you know, so, so I think we have to critically examine, you know, uh, instead of thinking very naively, oh, you know, Korean Americans are loved by the US and forever supported, that's our wishful thinking. Uh, in reality, painfully, uh, we had a mixed record, I would say that, you know, uh, so I think that we, we should keep in mind here. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I think back to the question, at least I should mention, you know, uh, I think some works. I, uh, I think most Korean immigration occurred after 1965. Mm -hmm. So, you know, more than two thirds of Korean Americans entered the US after 1965, or the children of those immigrants. So it's important to understand contemporary Korean American history, you know? And I think Korean immigrants, if they are coming in this new millennium, uh, they are not necessarily really, you know, uh, leaving military dictatorship. They are leaving Korea when Korea was already democratized. Okay, so I, I think just as the way we understand the US, uh, it shouldn't be really frozen in the past, same way, uh, I mean, you know, South Korea went through a lot and has been completely transformed, even politically. So I think we should really keep in mind. Uh, anyway, uh, back to the question, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, I, I will say that, um, 
there are uh, many works, but there are, I think, uh, documentaries. If you, you can even watch on YouTube, I would say that uh, the Forgotten War, you know, um, uh, uh, Dian Lemzi, uh, uh, yeah, Dian Lemzi, uh, I think they actually adopt the person. And uh, yeah, so the bunch of uh, documentaries uh, on YouTube is a very good source. I've been using it in my class and every time it was very, you know, my student were very much touched, I would say, the very educational, I would say that. Uh, I, I think just one point that uh, I, I was suggesting that we should move beyond introducing Korean food or K-pop, but I admit Korean food or K-pop is the best source, you know? That's how even African-Americans that I studied, this, that's how they were interested in Koreans or Korean culture. So I think it's, as a starting point, it's wonderful, you know? Food starting is point. Easy to, yeah, yeah uh, easy mm -hmm. to talk about it, yeah. But what yeah. I'm saying is we should go beyond just enjoying and consuming Korean culture. Uh, I think we have to understand Korean-American history, their struggles and what what is their vision? You know, what they try to do, how they try to produce Korean American culture, you know, kind of very healthy and meaningful way. So, so I think that's what I, I wasn't really opposing to, you know, uh, learn uh, whatever, enjoy K pop. And uh, my student, you know, that's, that's how the classes on UCLA are attracting uh, more non Korean American students than Korean American students. Yeah. So, okay. I'm Definitely. I, I, I don't think we could minimize the power of soft power. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but then once we get them, <laughs> then we have an opportunity to, I mean, it's those of us who are classroom teachers, I think we all uh, know that, you know, that is a, the best way to, you know, open people's minds is to feel them, com make them feel comfortable, make them feel safe. Um, and once that happens, then they are ready to, you know, dive into things a little bit deeper. So thank you so much to our presenters today. Uh, we really appreciate the, the deep, um, deeper conversation about Korean history, Korean American history, the intersection between Korean history and American history. And uh, so I looked and all of the suggestions and the brainstorming last week, one of my uh, coworkers and friends who's in here was like, do we have any short stories that I can use in my English classroom? So, <laughs> so I think this is all part of this conversation. This is why we're doing this because we are kind of at the entry level of things. And it's about, you know, getting, getting a body of, stuff together for lack of a better word so that we can you know what so we can be ready when uh, these classes are um, in our in our district uh, with that uh, thank you very much I want to remind you I know um, uh, we've been posting the uh, link for the evaluation so please do that I will do it one more time because I was also given the link as well before Ms. Shim left. And so there is the link for the evaluation, if you can please complete that. And I look forward to seeing all of you again next Wednesday, same time, same place. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you.